Hi, this is Filiberto Amati, and we are here today for a new session on the future of design this time. Our new research with Marco Bevolo, who is my uh, co-author. Uh, welcome, Marco. And Marco, please introduce our esteemed guest of today. Thank you very much. Uh, we are indeed uh, uh, starting uh, a new series of uh, uh, interviews uh, to uh, a number of uh, thought leaders and senior industry experts uh, worldwide. This time uh, we are uh, focusing on uh, design thinking. Uh, and indeed we start from design because if there is design thinking, there must be design uh, somewhere. Uh, our guest today is uh, uh, Eric Quint. Uh, Eric uh, is uh, uh, a design uh, leader uh, uh, who operated uh, since the 1990s in various uh, uh, positions, divisions, uh, and uh, uh, with uh, a growing task uh, uh, portfolio uh, with responsibilities that he expressed uh, uh, all over the world. He has been uh, uh, one of the leaders of uh, Philips Design, uh, from uh, the point of view of both uh, uh, domestic appliances and personal care, uh, down to establishing uh, the consulting uh, capability and capacity uh, team at uh, Philips Design in the 2000s. Uh, he has been uh, uh, chief design officer of 3M, and he is uh, uh, the author of uh, a book with uh, Gerda Gemser, uh, and uh, Giulia Calabretta of the Technical University Delft, Design Leadership Ignited, Elevating Design at Scale, where he captured and he summarized uh, all his uh, wisdom and his knowledge. I would like uh, to uh, ask uh, Eric uh, uh, to introduce himself uh, uh, with the first question uh, that is actually uh, Based on your experience, how would you define design uh, in first place and design thinking? And how do you see yourself in the, the context of design? Yeah, thanks for the question and thanks for having me in the, in the interview. Um, it's always interesting to talk about uh, the future of uh, design and design thinking. Um, well, if you would ask me what design is about, I would uh, define design uh, as creativity, applied with um, a purpose and with empathy. Uh, and uh, that's for me the shortest definition of design. And I think um, it's very nice to see that uh, design thinking as a kind of a mindset and a creative uh, problem solving approach is used across many different organizations and many different functions. But um, there is a risk uh, to that as well is that uh, the terms design thinking and design are really mixed up. Uh, you know, um, I very often say that um, everybody should be able uh, and uh, prefer to participate in a design think thinking exercise, but that does not make uh, everybody a designer. Yes. And I think we, we need to distinguish uh, the art craftsmanship of, of design uh, versus the, the methods and tools and approaches that designers are using to uh, mainly, uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, identify problems and solve problems. Because uh, design thinking for me is in the, uh, in the area of uh, problem definition as well as problem solving. Um, there is a nice uh, summary that I gave on design thinking where uh, there's a few keyword words that are very important, but it is a, a, a creative problem solving uh, approach. <clears throat> where uh, you work in multidisciplinary teams, use creativity to, uh, to help you to uh, uh, set the problem definition as well as the problem solving, uh, but you do it based on insights uh, and you use it for complex uh, problems. And there's a few words in there that are very important. Multidisciplinary, you, you're not doing it from within one discipline. Uh, uh, it is um, complex, high complex problems because uh, that's where the multidisciplinary and the design thinking and creativity is needed to come up with uh, solid solutions. So um, yes, and of course, they, uh, we all know the walls full of post-it notes 
that uh, are used to capture the ideas that uh, you have in, in, in uh, creative uh, uh, sessions and uh, design thinking exercises uh, that, uh, that that are used to, um, uh, to um, say, uh, organize your thoughts and uh, prioritize uh, the scenarios that could lead to, uh, to good solutions. Well, thank you very much. Um... I uh, will come back uh, uh, to the, the, the evolution of uh, design thinking uh, uh, and design itself uh, uh, from a point of view of strategic impact, but I would like uh, to uh, give the ball to Filiberto and ask Filiberto to, to shape uh, one or two questions uh, about a very hot topic uh, that is uh, the impact of uh, digitalization on design and especially the impact of uh, digitalization uh, on design thinking. So uh, we have seen examples of artificial intelligence uh, doing poetry uh, already a few years ago. Uh, Google is experimenting with in artificial intelligence doing uh, sort of uh, visual arts. Filiberto, would you like to, uh, to share with, uh, with uh, Eric uh, your view on digitalization and uh, bringing uh, uh, one or two questions about uh, digitalization and design? Thank you very much, Marco. <clears throat> yes, indeed, I think that, uh, you know, it's interesting how uh, we can use now algorithms and expose them to uh, various disciplines in arts, from poetry to writing to drawing to designing to composing music, and uh, you know, perfect actually uh, uh, the uh, the automatization of composing music and art and design and so on and so forth. So the it is clearly that uh, uh, that doesn't make it. Uh, art per se, it makes it as an artistic effort and probably it's creative in a very broad sense of the uh, topic but it, and the definition, but it's not really a creative input or a creative solution. But it opens the, the door to how this uh, uh, autonomization is uh, impacting, in particular, one of the central dimension that you pointed out in your definition, which is empathy. You know, how does that uh, uh, promotes or dilutes the notion of empathy within the process and uh, uh, whether uh, are designers to be afraid of the work that you know machines can do vis-a-vis uh, -vis the work that uh, basically humans can do uh, in the future? I think that's one step. And let's say as a context for that, as consultants, we have seen how the digitalization beyond and before artificial intelligence and even further now has completely changed uh, the landscape of, of our industry because consultants were very good at, to begin with, finding out information which wasn't readily available for everybody. We now live in a, actually in a uh, um, landscape of abundance of data and information. Uh, and so that has completely changed. And by the way, algorithms are better than humans at finding out patterns and understanding and you know, sorting through this data. So this requires a shift for consultants in the way they work. By the way, a lot of uh, consultants brain and, you know, uh, and intel intelligence can be now sold more easily to reports which are available to everybody. And this is probably the blue ocean for consultants in the future or in the present towards the future. So how that, does that change the role of designer, the work of designer and design thinkers in that sense? Well, I mean, there's a lot of um, questions in your uh, statements here. 
but uh, let's start uh, at um, uh, say the digitalization and the access uh, uh, of designers towards uh, say new tools. I remember a couple of decennia ago when uh, computer aided design was uh, offered to designers. Um, uh, one of the challenges that was there is that um, you need to understand the tools and you need to apply the tools in the right way. And so uh, you have seen and I have seen designers that were using computer aided design for everything throughout the whole design process and it was not very effective and not uh, very helpful, whilst uh, other designers were very precise uh, in uh, utilizing the tool in the, in the most effective way and using it particularly in those parts of the, of the process where uh, it added a lot of value. And so um, uh, having new tools uh, means also understanding the tools and knowing when and where and how to apply these tools. So if you look to digitalization, for instance, you have the, exactly the same uh, uh, challenges and opportunities there. Um, um, uh, one of the things that happened with the design thinking, I would say, is it, it heavily democratized uh, through uh, across, uh, say, different disciplines as well as different organizations and across industry as well to society and political and, uh, um, say, nonprofit uh, organizations as well. And so um, that is good because I think there's a lot of added value and advantages that uh, that design thinking approach can have. If you think about um, digital and the impact of digital, I see a few stages there. If you look now, uh, the most, um, uh, say, simple way of digitization is um, uh, tools that are now available uh, for uh, uh, say platforms more or less for collaboration. Uh, if you think about the uh, the Slack and the Mural and the Miro, these are great tools that we never had before, uh, and were really really helpful in the time of the pandemic uh, to uh, to connect people uh, in order to um, to um, keep working and do their design act uh, the best way they could do. So uh, the word collaboration, empathy is an important one, but collaboration is another very important one if you think about um, uh, the, the impact and the value of design. So uh, there's also uh, tools uh, in terms of research uh, that uh, are now digital that uh, give far much more flexibility and access to uh, say um, uh, audiences to check scenarios and certain hypotheses in a far more uh, versatile way uh, and very much more cost effective uh, across all regions, uh, to be honest. So uh, very, very interesting. But as Marco knows, uh, I was the leader of uh, a strategic design team that I have built in Philips. And we had a heavy uh, research based team with anthropologists, sociologists, strategists. And uh, what I have learned there is that it is amazing to see what kind of information and knowledge we can generate. But the added value is in the, in the application and the understanding of the, of the, of the knowledge. So uh, the knowledge in itself has no value uh, because if you, you're not able to interpret it and to, uh, to apply it in, in, in a meaningful way, it doesn't make any sense. So, uh, so if you then look to, um, say, um, uh, the, uh, the, the metaverse uh, and how that is impacting uh, uh, design and, and creativity, you can say um, uh, one of the most simple ways of describing what a company is about is, uh, is about identifying value, uh, developing value, and delivering value. And design is going across all of this. Uh, uh, the identification of the value is the innovation part, where you come up with hopefully the best ideas and the, and the, and the best scenarios that uh, make sense to impact society in a positive way uh, going further. But um, uh, that's in itself already a, a challenge to find out what are the, those best ideas. But then if you have your best ideas, you need to develop those ideas to uh, value propositions. And then you need to communicate about it to, uh, to, to bring those ideas uh, to your audiences, whoever they are. And what I see is that complexity is increasing uh, tremendously. Uh, you see that uh, in a uh, company setting, 
before there was a focus very much, well, totally not in the beginning because it was all about technology conversion. And uh, the customer was not always, uh, you know, in the center and the heart of that, uh, of that uh, value act. But um, for sure, lately, uh, the last two decennia, you see that uh, design and design approaches helped to put the customer at the heart of, uh, of all of this. Um, but now uh, what is talking about much more is uh, stakeholders. It is not about customer only anymore. So we talk about investors, uh, shareholders, customers, employees, communities, society. Um, and you see there is a move from a more, uh, say, performance-driven, um, uh, say, an act of performance to an, an act of, uh, that is driven by purpose. So I now come back to uh, your digital, uh, the digital opportunities that we have. Uh, if you think about artificial intelligence, uh, um, AV, uh, whatever we all have, uh, the interesting part of it is, is that there can be a predictive uh, element into all of that. And so if you think about a predictive element, that is particularly interesting if you talk about long cycle uh, industries and, uh, and decisions that are on a long cycle. Think, for instance, about, uh, you know, um, uh, actually all mobility industry uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is in the long cycle. So what does it mean as uh, creators, innovators, designers, you need to take decisions now on technology platforms and uh, how you build your value proposition that is probably ending up in the marketplace five to 10 years from now. And so you, that, that predictive part is, is in there. And you see it particularly in those industries, uh, a heavy research-based uh, uh, aspect, which in fashion is totally not there because in fashion, every quarter you get a new shot. Mm. Uh, and so uh, that is, I think, very important. Well, if you now think about society and the challenges we have as society, uh, and you think, for instance, about urban planning, then, uh, you know, the, the, the scope of urban planning is even up more on 20 years, 25, 30 years. So how as developers are we able to uh, design uh, aspects into the value proposition now that we, uh, that we know uh, or suspect that are uh, interesting for our audiences in 20 to 25 years from now? Mm -hmm. okay. And so uh, artificial intelligence uh, um, uh, and big data can be very uh, interesting to have that predictive uh, element into there where you, you can easily do uh, scenario building, where you can uh, come up with, um, uh, uh, say, scenarios that, uh, the, the, uh, say, the accuracy of those scenarios will, will go up. Still, the interpre interpretation and the application of all of that data needs to happen by uh, say multidisciplinary teams taking the right decisions and translating this into the right creations, uh, whatever they are. Thank you very much. Uh, follow up uh, on uh, on the notion you introduced of the democratization of design thinking. Isn't there a risk? Because now, by the way, uh, I did business school. I'm not a designer, but you actually get taught design thinking in business school. Some of the methodology, some of the aspects, uh, uh, foresight, sites, insights, problem solving, canvas, whatever, methodologies, brainstorming, and how to you know, choose the colors of the post-its, of course, and so on and so forth. But is there a risk that this democratization becomes a massification, then dilutes also? Sure, you know, it is a risk. So there's, uh, there's two, two sides of, of the coin here. At one side, it is great that uh, uh, you know, the, the approaches and the mindsets of, uh, of, of creatives and designers are thought uh, to um, other disciplines as well. I, I would uh, uh, refer to this as, uh, okay, the language of the designers is thought. So other disciplines uh, understand and can, can uh, interpret the language of designers in, in much better so that they can work uh, better together. But um, as soon as it starts to become a kind of an, uh, a substitute, uh, like, uh, okay, 
let me give me the, all the tools uh, related to uh, design thinking. And now I, I'm a designer, then things go completely wrong. And so I mentioned already, uh, uh, knowing about the design thinking, uh, 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 say tool sets and tools and mindset, uh, doesn't mean that you, you become a designer. And um, uh, I had that challenge many, many times in my practice where uh, when I was growing design in 3M, for instance, I got all of these um, requests of people, engineers and scientists that uh, uh, approached me by saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I want to come and work in your team. Uh, can you, um, I, and I have done a design thinking course at IDO D school. And, uh, and so I'm very ready to join the team. And I always said, well, that's very interesting. Uh, yes, we need, of course, uh, scientists and engineers and marketeers and whatever collaborators that understand what we do, because then we can better collaborate. You know, the fact that um, I might know about engineering processes doesn't make me an engineer or financial processes doesn't make me a financial expert. And I think um, one of the tasks that designers have is to uh, be, first of all, very proud about what design is. Uh, and uh, but also be very clear about um, uh, you know explaining um, uh, that uh, the added value is not in knowing about design thinking, it is about collaborating with design th uh, thinkers in a more effective way. And and I think that is one one of the risks uh, that um, when uh, I saw in 3M that uh, design thinking uh, became very popular, and you have companies like IBM that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, deployed uh, design thinking courses uh, for all uh, their employees almost uh, uh, all around the world. That, uh, that's, that's great to do, uh, but um, it's also good to know that uh, I think the ownership of, of design thinking should, with, uh, should be with design. Uh, uh, design is responsible as a function to develop the tool sets, to make sure that the communication is done right, to innovate uh, design if needed and design thinking, um, to communicate about it uh, and to collaborate through design thinking with all of these different functions. Um, and so, um, uh, yes, uh, 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 what I did is working together with HR and with R&D and with marketing to make sure that uh, those uh, tools were uh, accessible to everybody. But uh, if we would do a, a, a design thinking uh, workshop or an exercise, uh, design would be the, uh, the, uh, the owner of, of managing and coordinating and uh, mentoring all of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Marco? Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the, your, your uh, elaborate answer uh, gave uh, uh, some insight also about uh, our uh, shared history uh, in the 2000s at uh, Philips Design, when uh, uh, indeed the anthropologists, the psychologists, the sociologists were part of the design team, uh, which I always have to explain that in spite I, I am an Italian, I'm not a designer, but I'm a sociologist. Uh, and I don't study the society of today, but the society in five or 10 years, which makes my life very complicated. But you uh, understood immediately the first time we met in 1998, uh, uh, what was the, the, the scope of my uh, uh, specialization and how the specialization could fit in a design team, like uh, the one we, um, we belonged uh, those days and those years. Uh, looking uh, at your book, uh, um, you structure the book, uh, and this is the table of content uh, that I bring into light, uh, into three steps, uh, establishing the design foundation, empowering the design team, elevating to design excellence. So foundation, empowerment, excellence. I think uh, um, this will be probably interpreted by most people who uh, read and use the book to, uh, to lecture and to teach uh, as a roadmap. Uh, I also see uh, a potential uh, future progression for the design function within a company from foundation to empowerment to excellence. Um, do you think uh, uh, that uh, um, the design function should indeed follow this kind of roadmaps uh, whereby it, when, uh, when you install it, maybe it's not clear yet 
what a sociologist can do. And then when you are at the level of excellence, uh, you have a multidisciplinary team over time. And how do you see with this kind of roadmap thinking, if it's correct, how would you see the design as a practice and design thinking evolve in the future in general? So starting from the organizational reality in companies and then going into the dimension you mentioned of society and, uh, the, and culture. Well, uh, first thing is, if you are approached by a CEO uh, to uh, uh, have a role uh, as a chief design officer, you, um, the task is pretty simple. You can summarize that in one sentence. It's something like, uh, can you help us to build a creative and design platform, global platform, uh, that um, and build the uh, the um, the um, uh, capabilities around this to advance, uh, uh, say, innovation and advance the brand for the company. Uh, so that's one sentence, and then you start to think, okay, what does it mean? And um, um, you know, everything has a has a timing. Uh, we know in innovation, timing is very important. Uh, uh, because you can have the most uh, marvelous ideas and you can have uh, a view of uh, the most advanced uh, design function. But if the enabling conditions and the capabilities are not there in the company, you, you go nowhere. So uh, first thing you need to do as a leader is understand what is the zero measurement, uh, so, so to say, what is the, the actual, uh, uh, say, uh, state of the art of the design uh, function and creativity and uh, collaborate, creative collaboration in the company before you can make a plan how to go forward. Uh, making a roadmap is extremely important. Um, uh, one of the things we learned from the research, uh, so we, for the book we researched uh, 59 uh, design leaders all around the world, and uh, what I have seen is that uh, there was a lot of passion and energy uh, of those leaders to, uh, to, to elevate design and to grow uh, design in those organizations, in their organizations. Uh, but I saw also, at the other hand, a lot of uh, disappointment and uh, challenge and even frustration in many cases of people not, um, you know, achieving what they had in mind. And th there, w there was a mismatch between their ambition uh, out there and the realities and how to get there. And so uh, one great way is uh, to, um, um, to set a strategic vision, uh, but also be very openly about it. Uh, and, uh, and make a roadmap of how you come from the as is to the to be. Uh, why is that important? Because um, it helps you to manage expectations. Uh, it's it's, it's a, a very good way of avoiding that the organization is pulling you in, in all kinds of, uh, uh, say, ventures that maybe are not yet the appropriate ones uh, because you're not there yet. And if you are very clear about what your roadmap is, you, uh, you, you set expectations and you say, oh, you know, wait, uh, on my roadmap, what you expect me now to do doesn't make a lot of sense. We're not ready for it, but maybe in two years or in a year, we're ready for it. So that's one of the things. Um, and uh, the thing that was missing most in those interviews that we found out was what, what I call a design governance. And so the design governance is a kind of an aligned a document where you agree uh, an endorsed document and communicated document where you have put down, say, the starting points for the engagement of design with all of the organization. So that means that um, in the, um, in the uh, uh, document, uh, you, you have defined and agreed about uh, how is design sponsored in terms of budgeting. Uh, who is managing the designers? Um, what is the location of the designers? If you, if you talk about, uh, you know, uh, in one design studio or scattered around the, the businesses, uh, it's about the rules of engagement of, uh, of uh, where is, where is uh, and how is the design team enabled? And of course, the scope of design, you know, are you only tactical? Are you also in strategic? Are you uh, <coughs> mainly focusing on the innovation part or also in brand, uh, you know, uh, what is the scope? Uh, and what I have seen is that, uh, and I refer very often to this, is that uh, if you don't uh, have that groundwork and, and the framework uh, defined of what that function is going to be, 
uh, you run the risk that if you start to elevate design and grow design, that you, uh, you ask for trouble. You are going to scale trouble. Mm-hmm. And that happens a lot. And so it is very nice to have uh, all of these visionary ideas of what the function could be. Uh, I mean, very often uh, related to design excellence. But um, you can be very sophisticated, but if the foundation is not there, then uh, you are not uh, probably very successful in scaling at all. Uh, so uh, the methodology that we uh, uh, say uh, talk about in the book is uh, indeed setting that foundation. And then uh, you have to, of course, empower the team uh, uh, later on in growing. So by setting the foundation, you have, of course, the, um, the elements of, uh, uh, you know, what is design leadership about? Uh, what is design about? Uh, what is your vision and mission? Uh, and then you go into uh, the, the next steps of the model where you talk about um, elements that, uh, uh, that are components to uh, go from the foundational elements to the, um, uh, the empowerment of the team and the growing of the team uh, to, uh, in the end, uh, driving that design excellence. Well, you should realize that that is not an, uh, an overnight act uh, that can easily take uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, I have given myself five years at 3M to do this. And, uh, you know, just because of the complexity, because you talk about organizations that are in, in, uh, in uh, you know, 80 countries. They have, you talk about uh, 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 many different divisions and, 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 and businesses, 50 or 30. Uh, you talk about uh, 100,000 people. And, uh, and so that means that that is uh, hugely complex and therefore it is a transformation process. So it is not, adding design to an organization is not about adding the capabilities somewhere. It is actually how the company works because you have to integrate it into processes. And so therefore in the steps, uh, we talk about uh, in order to um, establish that foundation very well, uh, you need to make sure that you have a clear design direction. So that's the design roadmap and the strategy and the vision going forward. Uh, then you need to build a kind of a design organization where that governance comes in as well, uh, because you need to have an alignment with all of the stakeholders in the company to do so. And then if you go to empowering the team, you need to have a design taxonomy available to make sure that you um, you have described the scope of design, but also you have uh, described the career path of the people in design so that they know what their future is and how they can grow and learn uh, as well as uh, how you build design resources and you need to innovate what new resources do i need for instance in the, the digitization uh, to make sure that we are we are uh, ready to go for uh, elevating design to that excellence level it's there where you start to scale and uh, where you uh, you uh, you hope to bring that uh, uh, that vision alive where you uh, you build that design excellence and and what is now the um the um the, 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 the learning of the book is that uh, that design excellence is never reached because uh, you're always on an, on a journey and that it has a moving target uh, where uh, the dynamics in society and in companies is changing that means that design need to be very uh, versatile and uh, and uh, Say adaptive to uh, to new situations, and that means that you 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 excellence is an act of continuous reinvention uh, that that keeps you uh, you know in uh, in the Premier League of uh, of, of acting uh, design. May I? Uh, I mean, this is very insightful. Uh, two follow ups uh, intertwine. So, in terms of design leadership. In the post-COVID-19 era, where uh, uh, remote work is a reality, how do you, uh, or not how do you, but what is your recommendation in terms of uh, uh, do's and don'ts to keep building a culture within the design organization, even though you have remote workers and people don't necessarily meet as often, and Related to that, uh, based on what you just commented, is the role, uh, because I see the role of creativity to you know, reshape the boundaries. So is the role of the design organization to make, transform the companies to become more inclusive, more sustainable, and how so? Yeah, so uh, if you think about, um, 
that that future role of design, then uh, I think complexity is getting more. Uh, of course, um, it's not good enough anymore to put the customer in the center of, uh, of all of this. I think we need to put society in the center of all of this. Uh, and so if, if that is the case, then the complexity is getting up. And so the need for design across all of the main processes of a company and the need for creativity and collaboration is extremely important. And, uh, and so if you think about um, the sustainable development goals, you know, they are all uh, of, a, of, of systematic, uh, systemic uh, uh, complexity. And so that means you, you, you need to uh, go already into a strategic approach, not a tactical approach, to, uh, to go and, uh, and work on these. But even uh, more important, uh, you cannot solve these kind of uh, challenges anymore from within one organization. So uh, if you think about water or air or education or health or mobility, these are all these big themes. Um, you need to work together across the boundaries of organizations, uh, industries, policymakers, uh, governments, uh, educational instit institutes and academic institutes to make sure that you come up with, uh, with uh, let's say, scenarios and uh, uh, solutions uh, that, uh, that go beyond. Uh, you know, maximizing the shareholder value within one organization. Uh, so there is a role for design to play. Why? Because I think uh, besides the empathy that uh, designers can bring in, but can, other people can do that as well, uh, is um, the creativity and particularly the imagination, I think that is ex extremely important. So what I have seen in many, with many business leaders, they know exactly how to run a business. They know how to define their KPIs. They know how to fire up uh, uh, an, an organization in the, in the good way uh, of uh, uh, putting uh, say the people behind the strategy and the vision. But in the end, um, you need to lead uh, organizations to what that preferable future is. And so uh, imagination is important to have, but also how to make that uh, the imaginary uh, uh, say strategies uh, tangible is something where designers come in uh, very often. Uh, uh, so uh, in the book we describe about that future role of designers and um, what we see is a kind of an equilibrium uh, where the designer or design leaders are in the center one way or the other and uh, we have to deal at one side uh, about um, uh, the emerging technologies and how to incorporate those into our act of design and design thinking going forward. Uh, but we need to also inspire culture where you are an, a, a cultural leader to, cr to create a creative culture within an organization and even beyond your own design team. You are um, leading and, 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 uh, and uh, say engaging in uh, advancing collaborations, like I mentioned already, far beyond the collaborations within your own team, uh, within your own organization. It is, you know, across organizations and uh, across different types of organization. Um, and then, of course, there is that design for equity that uh, you want to make sure that um, whatever solutions you, you come up with and engage into is uh, ac accessible to anybody, hopefully, uh, in the world. And so how are you going to deal with that? Because we know the disparity between you know, uh, accessibility of health and um, uh, access to health and energy and clean water and all of that is, is, is becoming bitter, uh, bad, uh, bigger and is not going to help us to uh, solve the issues that we have and that are mentioned in the, um, in the, in the goals, in the United uh, Development uh, Goals. Uh, and then, of course, this is all about uh, sustainable uh, innovation which is uh, impacting the planet, uh, 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 where, uh, you know, designers play a role. Now, uh, Philippe, to, to come back on your question on, you know, the post-COVID and uh, how is that going to happen? In my previous role, I was chief brand and uh, design officer of the company. Why? Because uh, my act was not only focusing on uh, the technology conversion, uh, say the innovation process, but also very much on, and that was the identification of value, but also on the development and the delivery of the value. So the delivery of the value is very much a marketing and a branding act. And I always say, uh, you know, the most exciting brands, they don't happen 
<laughs> and they, know, they don't exist by coincidence. They are carefully curated and designed. And so uh, if you think about an, um, a world where we live in now, where everybody is working from home, uh, there is a kind of a dualism uh, that we describe many more in the book, uh, uh, dualisms that design leaders have to navigate, is the dualism of, uh, you know, having a fully remote uh, team at one side and having a, 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 few, a full on-site team that you can work with and have dialogues with and uh, start to uh, shape, uh, you know, um, ideas for the future. Uh, I think both are probably not good. Uh, but uh, you will for sure get a hybrid where I think you uh, will um, utilize the, uh, um, the things that we have learned through the COVID that we probably are, are much more flexible in allowing people to work from home and also uh, seeing people adding value uh, in that way. Uh, but at the other hand, you need to also be together, uh, particularly when it comes down to different disciplines and across uh, people across different organizations to um, to build relationships uh, that are uh, going to help to um, to create those uh, you know answers on the bigger complex questions and challenges that we have in the world. So uh, so yeah, that's probably my answer. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Michael. Well, as a last question, I would like to go at the very first page of the book, uh, and it's a bit of an intellectual question, maybe, but uh, uh, I'm curious. Uh, the answer is printed, but I'm curious to hear it from you. Um, in, in Italian design, especially, the role of the book by the designer is really uh, crucial. Uh, Andrea Branzi has, uh, has published uh, a lot of uh, a lot of books. Uh, um, uh, you have books by uh, by Rota on uh, on his creative process. Important books by Sotsas and so on. You chose to publish the book uh, with uh, two co-authors uh, who are academics uh, and uh, actually the, the preface of the book uh, is why this book with these authors that is quite uh, for me insightful. Uh, why did you, you could have, you know, you, you could have uh, done the book with, uh, with a journalist, you could have done the book uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, different uh, co-authors along uh, with a ghostwriter. Why did you choose um, Gerda and uh, Giulia Calabretta from university uh, context? Well, um, uh, you know, uh, the need for the book was actually instigated uh, to me several times when doing, um, say, uh, lectures and, and, and uh, keynote speeches, where people ask me after the speech, uh, well, Eric, have you written a book? Uh, we would love to, to read more about your experiences and your insights. And I never had the time to do that. And um, um, in uh, learning um, uh, uh, about uh, Gerda's work and uh, Julia's work, who wrote a book about strategic design before, so in the research, we have learned through the eyes of uh, 59 other design leaders, uh, all kinds of different approaches and challenges and dualisms that they need to navigate and how successful they are and not. And um, so um, the experiences that I bring uh, to the book is a bit of a description of um, what I have learned over the last 35 years, uh, uh, in many cases in the hard way. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that uh, uh, the substance and the um, uh, the, uh, the foundation of the book is much more more wider, going wider than my personal opinion and experiences on. And so that is the value of the book. And it is interesting that you ask this, but <laughs> if you would ask me what what is the um, uh, the essence of how you approached your role at 3M, I would say, well, I have uh, applied design thinking to my own uh, challenge that I had to bring design to the next level in, in 3M. If you would ask me, how have you uh, written the book? I would say to you, I have applied design thinking and collaborative approaches to writing a book that goes far more beyond what uh, I think as an individual, but is a mix of uh, insights and the experiences of two academics 
uh, and other design leaders, that makes it a more a comprehensive and uh, hopefully a more valuable uh, book uh, with, uh, what is it, 170 quotes of those uh, people that we have interviewed to give it more substance and, um, and, a, and a better, uh, you know, maybe inspiration for, for those future generations. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, our uh, this dialogue is coming uh, to uh, to its closure. Our dialogue is uh, going to continue for another. Uh, we know each other for twenty three years, so I would suggest uh, twenty three years ahead, we will uh, have another uh, interview with Philibert, and we will discuss. Uh, <laughs> your next, uh, uh, your next uh, chapter in, uh, in your book. Filiberto, would you like to close? No, I just wanted to thank you, Eric, for taking the time and talking to us. It has been really a great and inspiring conversation. So uh, uh, I look forward to speaking to you in the future, you know, maybe doing a, a second take uh, on the future of design. That's how the book started. After the first interview with Gerda and Julia, they decided to have a few interviews uh, and then yeah. we decided to write the book. So my pleasure. And uh, um, yeah, I think uh, what we have discussed uh, and, and much more detail and flavor you can find back in the book. So um, uh, feel free to, uh, to read the book and enjoy. And uh, thank you for having me. Well, thank, thank you. you thank you very much. Thank you.